Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor since 1973. The NBA and NHL season's in full swing. swing. SeatGeek, smartest, easiest way to get tickets to your favorite team's games. Buy and sell tickets in just two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. I found out this week that my mom uses SeatGeek to buy opera tickets. And... Which is amazing because she is the, the technologically most inefficient person that I know and loves SeatGeek and gets great deals. They have a revolutionary grading system. Try it out. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. We were also brought to you by the Ringer NBA show. I went on there yesterday, Monday, with Chris Vernon and broke down the Boogie Cousins trade for 56 action-packed, thrilling minutes. And made the case that it was, as unbelievable as it seems, the best possible deal they could have made since there were no other real suitors. Check that out. The Ringer NBA show. Subscribe now. And obviously, we're brought to you by The Ringer, where uh, you can read my column every Friday, including the trade deadline on Thursday. I'm sure I'll have something on Friday. And it's one of the reasons we have this guy here, because I'm fascinated by what it's like for a player as the trade deadline approaches. JJ Reddick coming up right now. J.J. Reddick. Um, you were traded at the trade deadline once. Yeah, 2.59 p.m. 2.59 p.m.? A minute to spare. Did you know you were going to get traded that week? Or were you? did you think there was a chance? Like, what's the process? Are you just refreshing the internet all the time? What are you doing? It was weird because going back to the summer before, um, we had a new coach, Jacques Vaughn. We had a new GM, Rob Hennigan. So I met with Rob that summer and I was just like, hey man, if you can just kind of keep me in the loop as things are happening. I, I was an expiring deal at the time. I think it was like a $6.2 million expiring deal, which at the time, you know, yeah. with the salary cap was a, a typical sort of contract that you, that would get traded, especially in a rebuilding situation like we were in. So like with a month to go before the deadline, uh, you know, Rob and I talked and I was like, you know, I would like to be here. I like to kind of see this rebuild through. And he said, all right, you know, I, I, I think that's an option for us too. Uh, then with about like a week to go, um, I knew there were a few teams, Milwaukee, Detroit. Um, you guys weren't playing that well either. San Antonio. Yeah. We were terrible that yeah. year. Uh, San Antonio was another team. So there's like a few teams that were, that were interested in me. Um, we were in Dallas the day of the trade deadline and we decided to stay over. So we're sitting at the hotel and Arn Tellum, my agent at the time, called me and he's like, you're safe. You're not getting dealt. Oh, no. And I said, great. So I get on the bus. We get to the airport. Uh, as soon as we get to the airport, there's, there's always two buses. First bus is the player's bus, coach's bus. We always get to get off first. For some reason, they let the other bus off, which is like the training staff, you know, Fox Sports people. Uh, so they're getting on the on the plane first. So I'm like, this is this is a little weird. And then as the players started getting off the bus, they they kind of just started holding guys back. It was like Josh McRoberts, Ish Smith, Gustavo Ayon, and I was like, fuck, something's going down. <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, Arn called me like as I'm waiting there as one of four guys, and he's like, it's uh, it's looking like Milwaukee. And then at about it, literally at 2:59 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Rob called me and said, hey, uh, we just traded you to Milwaukee. And uh, so it was a nerve wracking uh, week leading up. And then it was a it was a nerve wracking sort of 24 hours. And even when you feel safe as a player, you're still I'm not like refreshing my Google alerts, but like you're still on Hoopsype. You're still on Twitter, like trying to figure out, is there anything going on? You're talking to your agent uh, just about every day, uh, which I will continue to do this week. And um it's nerve wracking though. So you knew a couple of years ago, you knew there was a better chance you might get traded than like this trade deadline, but you're still in the mix. Like you can't feel a hundred percent safe. Who knows? I, I don't think I've ever felt a hundred percent safe. Yeah. Um, well, the first year with the Clippers, you must have felt safe because Doc was <laughs> building a whole offense around you running off picks and well, stuff. The, my first year with the Clippers, I was hurt. Um, I broke my wrist. Um, Earlier in the year, when I came back, I played about 10 games. Then I had a back injury. So I was out at the deadline. Um, that day, similar situation. We were on the plane. Uh, I can't remember where we were headed, but we were on the plane. And we're all in the player's cabin refreshing Twitter. Just, <laughs> and there's this like trade that's supposed to go down between a few of our guys and a few of the Knicks guys centered around Amon Shumpert. And, 
And so like we're getting real time info from, you know, the Mark Steins and the Woges of the world and uh, Doc's like 30 feet away on the phone. This it was it was the most surreal thing ever. Ultimately, uh, there weren't any major trades. I think we, we dumped BJ Mullins and, and Jamison in sort of salary dump. But yeah, there wasn't a major trade. Is it weird that Doc is it weird as a player that Doc is your coach, but is also the guy who's ultimately going to have final say on who gets traded? It is. It's a weird thing. Uh, I felt like the first probably two years, it was it was uh, it was a little different. Um, he's surrounded himself now in the front office with a lot of great people, and Lawrence Frank is up there now. And yeah, he's I guess sort of the de facto guy now, um, and he's taken some of the responsibility off Doc. But I had never experienced that before, so it was it was definitely surreal those first couple years. So if he yells at you in practice, you're like, oh my god, <laughs> no, I'm gonna go on the trade machine. No, it's interesting. I mean, that's listen, that's. Ultimately, like why we have the judicial system and the legislative branch and, and yeah. the, the executive branch is checks and balances. Right. Um, so you need people like around you. If you're going to take on that role, like like a few guys have in this league, like like Bud and uh, Pop and, and Tibbs, like if you're going to have that role, you need good people around you. So Carmelo, it becomes out that Carmelo might get dealt and that it's only the Clippers, the Cavs yeah. or the Celtics. And everybody just, including myself, just starts making up trades left and right. <laughs> and with the Clippers, it's like they, they, for whatever reason, they're on the record saying we wouldn't trade any DeAndre, Chris, or Blake for Carmelo. That's off the table. I don't even know how that got reported, but somehow that became fact. I don't know where it came from. So then everybody's looking at like the Rivers contract, Jamal Crawford, yeah. you. My name got thrown in there. There's yeah. not a lot of contracts that can add up to what it would take to get Carmelo back. So are you are you aware? Because you're trying to play. You're playing four games a week, basically. Are you aware of all this as it's going on, or you're trying to tune it out? You're you're trying to tune it tune it out. But at this point, to have your name in a trade like a trade rumor, you've you've learned by now that uh, until you actually get the call, hey, you've, you've been traded, it it really doesn't matter. It's like it's like worrying about a hypothetical. You just can't get caught up in that. But it's hard not to be aware. We were playing in um in Golden State. Uh, the week, sort of the, those few days when this was like heavy in the news, this yeah. Clippers Knicks thing, and uh, you know I'm going out for for warm ups before the game with like 50 on the clock doing my shooting routine, and I have like four Warriors fans. I hope you like it in New York. <laughs> you're out of here, Redick. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to pretend you're not yeah, listening to yeah, them, yeah. but I mean, I, you know, you can't really tune that out when they're 10 feet away from you. Right. Well, I mean. You know, this. how many years have you been in the Clippers now? Four? It's my fourth year, yeah. And this has been this run where it never all came together. Every year there's yeah. been a hiccup or a stumble. And the best chance you had was that Rocket Series when you're up, what, 25 in game five and it looks like it's done. I went to that game. The Rockets were hard and checked out. I think it was 19. Or 19, whatever it was. It was game six. But it was 19, yeah. we, we uh... Was it game six or game five? It was game six. Because we, we went... Back to oh, Houston yeah, you for could game have won five. Game. Yeah, they yeah, had, that's they right. had home court. Yeah. So we had game six at our place. Blake made a 360 layup in the third quarter. And I remember looking over at the bench and, you know, everybody's celebrating. And I'm like, oh, it's a party in here. Like, and then they bench Harden in the fourth quarter. Harden, Harden <sighs> checked out. I yeah. love Harden. I'm a huge Harden defender, and but he checked out in that it game. It was the, the Josh Smith and Corey Brewer game. But, you know, even like last year um, and, and this year, if I'm being if I'm being honest, it's it's tough to evaluate our team, right? Um, because you know that our four man group and then Luke as well, like our our net rating is as you know as good as any five man unit I think except for the Warriors. And yeah. so to to sort of evaluate us uh, when we're healthy is one thing, but we've just had Chris and Blake have just been in and out of the lineup, uh, and then of course last year in the playoffs they're they're gone after you know the third or fourth quarter of game four so what do you think was the best clippers team of all those of the four you've been on or what, what did you feel like was the highest ceiling team um pr probably the first two years and, and the first year we lost to okc we had a chance to win game five at their place uh game six at home um you know it was it was a kind of a devastating loss in game five we were, yeah. we were up i think 11 with like four minutes to go we lose um game six uh i didn't even realize this till i watched the game a couple of years ago but we were up like 19 in the first half yeah and they came kevin durant had an unbelievable second quarter came back and they beat us um 
but that was before the Warriors were the Warriors. Yeah. Uh, San Antonio ended up winning that year. So that, you know, I'm not saying we would have beat San Antonio in the next round, but that was a, a chance for us. And then the following year was before the Warriors were this this juggernaut. They were really good. They won 67 games. They won it all. But I, I still think that year in the in the conference finals, we would have had a shot against them. We had beaten them the year before. We had beaten them nice. in the playoffs the year before. Which actually turned series. out to be the best thing that happened to them. They went through that game seven. And I don't know. They got good game seven. This is what it's like reps that I think really helped them the next year. The problem with the year after, I thought your best team was the year that Houston knocked you out yeah. just because of how well Blake was playing. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the best I've ever seen Blake play. I, I remember writing at the time, I thought he was that spring, the third best player in the league. And he's never, you know, whether injuries, whatever it start, it feels like it's starting to come back for him. But, uh, but I, I like the way you matched up with the team. The problem is the bench, they, he had to play everybody so many minutes, like the top six. And I really thought that that game six against Houston, that's when it wore out. Blake was dead in the second half yeah, Blake of that game. Blake and I talked about that. Yeah. We, well, going back to the first round series, we had a, a seven-game slugfest with the yeah. Spurs, which was as tough a series as I played in my career. And Blake and I have talked about this, but I remember in game seven – in Houston in the fourth quarter, like coming out of a timeout. And it, at the time it was maybe like a seven or eight point game and just being like, Oh my God, I You're have just done. nothing in the tank. Yeah. And after the game, I talked to Blake. He's like, I felt the same way. He's like, I, neither of us had ever really felt that before. You know, you yeah. just feel like you have nothing left physically right. in the tank. Um, well, for you, that's that's murder because you need your legs to. Yeah. You're running. It was around, tough for me that screens. series too because you know I was I was tasked I was the main guy tasked with guarding Harden, so I yeah. had to guard Harden and then also uh, you know run circles on offense. Right. <laughs> And guarding Harden is basically every play. You just kind of it's try to get play. in his way as yeah, he does I his mean, crazy stuff. There, there's there's a strategy to it, but it, it doesn't work very well. He's 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 pretty damn good. Is he your biggest nightmare to guard, or you don't um, want to give anybody the? Uh... We have Luke now, so the last two oh, years true. Luke has has matched up. Because right, I don't imagine even how. First of all, he, all the other stuff he does, the fact that he's lefty. Mm -hmm. I always feel like the lefties are the most... My dad is like the all-time fan of lefties. He feels yeah. like as guys get tired, you kind of just forget. Like there'll be some brain fart where you're like, oh yeah, I forgot he's, and he's already going by you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just, it's, he's so unconventional. I don't know how you would stop it. Yeah, the only other guy that <clears throat> that was like him was Ginobili in his prime. Right. And those are two of the toughest guys that I've had to guard in my career. Um you know, I've had to guard Kobe and Dwayne Wade, you know, my position. And those guys in their prime were unbelievable. Um, but there is something about the quirkiness of, of Ginobili and Harden's game that right. is is really challenging. Yeah, I remember when Harden got traded, I remember writing something about he could be the Manu on this OKC team. And, like, his destiny is, like, kind of a better version of Manu. I never expected him to be what he became. I, I don't think there were... I don't he think was many clearly people good. Did. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think it, many people. Did. I never would have guessed he was going to be one of the five best guys it in the seemed, league. It's weird because it seemed like at the time it was a great role for him yeah. in OKC, like where he he starred in that role. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, like he he was a star in his in his role, and then he became a top three player, right? Within the span of two years, he was such a weapon because he could just win a game by himself potentially, or. They didn't need him at all. Yeah, you know, and Durant and Westbrook could do it. You, it's funny because you've had, you've had these Clipper seasons where it's just like the bad luck season, or oh man, why? Are they? But yet in Orlando in '09, it was the opposite. It was like that everything could go right all right. the way to the finals thing, where it just kind of <laughs> came together perfectly. So you yeah. felt that too. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say everything went right because Jameer was an All Star that year and he got hurt right before the All Star game. He, he tore his labrum. And had surgery. Good point. And we picked up Ray for Alston. We, we picked up Ray for Alston. Uh, I always like to say, like our our rotation that year was Ray for Alston, Courtney Lee, Turk, Richard, Dwight, and then off the bench was Anthony Johnson, myself, Beatrice, and Gortat. Like that was the team that got That's us a nice to the team. finals. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, it's it's nine deep at least. Yeah, it was. A, it was a deep team. Um, Garnett was hurt that year. That's, which Paul likes to, Pierce likes to remind me of well, on he's a daily right. basis. That was the best Celtics team. I yeah. think they were like 35 and five when KG got hurt. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It was a great team. And, uh, and then, you know, the, 
the the first game one against Cleveland, we're down like twenty two in the first half. Yeah, that place is so loud, um, and I'm thinking, oh god, we don't have a sh- we don't we don't have a shot yeah, against these guys. Out. We won that game, and uh, and really just like we we played unbelievable that series. Then we had some. I, I, honestly, we had some bad luck in the finals, though. I mean, Courtney you Lee did. missed a the layup, layup. that could have sent it to, to or won it at the end of regulation in Game Two. Um, game Four broke our backs. We're up eighty-seven, eighty-two with forty seconds to go, and Dwight at the free throw line. Somehow that game goes to overtime, and we lose it. And well, you had the Derek Fisher three. Was Derek the Fisher moment. three. I don't know. I think it was Jameer. Somebody didn't come out on him in time. It was Jameer. Yeah. yeah. I love Jameer, but it was Jameer. That was a tough one. <laughs> Jameer is now having a, his third renaissance in Denver. Oh, he's great. He's like kicking ass. He's, he's like my he age. can play, man. He can play. Yeah, I think that Lakers Magic series was way closer and way more yeah. dangerous for the Lakers than anyone seems to remember now, oh. which happens sometimes. Like Jalen and I used to talk about the 2000 finals, the Lakers' first championship. That was the Philly one. It was it was Indiana the, versus Indiana. Uh, yeah, it was Indiana. I remember watching in Indiana, that one. That was yeah. it was way close. It was two two, or it was two no, it was two one. But then it goes into overtime. Game four in Indy. Shaq fouls out. Kobe has to put the team on his back. It was the first time he'd ever done it. Yeah. The game six was super close. Jalen still feels like the officials robbed them. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, those the O nine Magic. LeBron was at the peak of his early powers in that mm-hmm. series. I think he was like thirty. 37 and 12 or something. It was like he had crazy numbers. It was every time. Every game, too. It was consistently. He played well. He played well. But that t- the team he had around him, you could just... The yeah. Dwight thing was, was... I mean, that's about as good as Dwight's been in terms of rebounding, blocking shots, not caring if you're running plays for him. He's just doing all the stuff that you'd ever want from Dwight in a playoff series. And 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 still averaged like 25. Like he, yeah. he he was so good, he didn't have to have plays called for him. We could just run that spread pick and roll, surround him with shooters, and it worked. It's interesting that DeAndre has embraced what Dwight never totally embraced, which is like just, just rebound and block shots and, and dunk alley-oops and set picks and you're you're a devastating center but if we're posting you up now you're hurting us because you're not a great post-up player and we have better offensive players around you De- doc came in and just immediately was like deandre this is how we're using you it's, and it, and he embraced it it's been a good sort of uh working partnership between doc and, and dj i mean the I, the year before doc came uh DJ didn't play in the fourth quarters. Oh, yeah. They just he averaged like I went 24, 25 minutes a game, something yeah. like that. Um, I mean, it, he always, I guess, showed potential, you know, from, from afar, from a distance watching the Clippers play. You know, he's got potential. But um, three years later, he's first team all NBA. He's on the Olympic team. Now right. he's an all star four years later. I think he's been terrific this season. Great. I yeah. was saying, I think, I said a couple of weeks ago, I think he's the most underrated player in the league now. Really? Yeah, I do. I I don't think people realize how good he's been and and what a just a consistent force he is. And it's also the way the league has shifted. There's not a lot of big guys left who can yeah. stay out there and do all the things he can do without hurting their team right. in some way. Like I think the Detroit's really struggled with Drummond. Like how do we use this guy? How do we use the good parts of him? Right. And cover up the parts that aren't as good. I think for maybe a, an old school traditional NBA fan, uh, guys like. DJ and, and Drummond are, are frustrating to them because they you can't just throw the, throw them the ball on the block and they go right. score. That's just not who they are. But in today's NBA, those guys are as valuable as anybody. The guys that are that are true fives defend the rim, are mobile enough to get out and, and cover pick and rolls, and then offensively they just roll to the rim every time. I mean that's that's really the value because shooting is 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 valued, and then you need a big guy who rolls and has that threat of a lob to create space for shooting. That's why I like New Orleans Noel if he can stay yeah. in the court. There was like this two week window yep. where I thought the Celtics were going to steal him, and he would just would have been awesome with Isaiah. Like imagine covering Isaiah and New Orleans Noel on a on a high screen and roll, and he's never been in that situation. But now Philly knows that he's good. They're not trading him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting though because I, he has a lot of value. Yeah, and there's a lot of teams that could really, really use him, and he right. could end up being a, a star like in, in the same way that DJ is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like this is the last dance for the Clips? you feel like everybody's on this team next year? Because, yeah, Blake is a free agent. 
if Chris is a free agent, you're a free agent, and like you know, the, because of all the injuries, nothing you, would surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, if, if you told me that four years from now, like we're all still playing together, I'd be like, uh, I could see, uh, I could see that happening. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if you told me that one of us leave, two of us leave, I, I could see that happening too. Um, I think a lot of it does depend on what happens in the playoffs, and that's ultimately. You know where we've been judged, and we'll, where we'll be judged at the end of the season. It's not going to be as easy this year because because of all the injuries, you're going to be a five or a six seed probably. Yeah, I mean, which means you got to go on the road. It's going to be tough. I mean, we'd love to get in that third seed, but I think we're four four back uh, in the loss column, three or four back in the loss column with Houston right now. Um, you know, we're we're battling right now for first round home court. You need uh, you Utah. need to, you need injuries on a team that's not your team. <laughs> you need like it's you had Harden, most of the bad. Can luck. Harden have an ankle injury? Yeah, Nothing serious. Hamstring. Nothing Sprained serious. Ankle. I don't want it. I would never <laughs> wish a serious injury on anyone. Or like mono or something like a yeah, two week yeah. mono bout. The uh, the Rockets are fascinating to me because they need to make one more trade. They need one more perimeter guy, and if they get them, if they get that guy, and I don't know who it is, then. You know, I think you and the your your team and the and the Rockets are the two teams that could game the system against the Warriors a little bit. You, know? you don't think the Spurs? Well, the Spurs are the Spurs. I would yeah. never. I think the Spurs they're over here. Like I, they, yeah. they can obviously go toe to toe. The Rockets can just kind of shoot threes and get hard and hot and just be funky and unconventional. And then you guys, you've played the the Warriors so many times. There's a familiarity that I think is. A real I feel advantage. like right now there's a familiarity with us getting our asses kicked. Well, that's, that's been recent. <laughs> like, they've completely dominated us. Uh, yeah. I think we won, geez, man, two seasons ago on Christmas Day. You haven't had your whole team. And haven't, haven't beaten them since. Yeah. Um, I was surprised there was a Thursday night game about a month ago that it just there, there was not a lot of fight in the Clippers. And that was, was that the game at Golden State or was that the home game? It was the home game. The home game. Yeah. There was the, it was there was no fight and that that made me think it like it was the high scoring one. We yeah. scored a lot. But yeah. I think the I think the Warriors had like a hundred and twenty eight offensive efficiency night or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You need when's Chris come back? Soon. Sooner than people realize. It t- it, <laughs> Breaking news. No. He'll be back very soon. <laughs> it turns out that when Chris Paul is out there, it's probably better for you guys. That's one of my expert <laughs> yeah, opinions. Yeah. It's nice to have the, yeah. the best point guard in the it's, league it's on nice your team. It's nice to have, yeah, one of the five to ten best players in the world. You yeah. could argue that you survived. This could have been worse. I think we did fine. Blake, the first game back, I think, was the Philly game at Philly. We lost. Yeah. Blake was, you know, getting his rhythm. Since that game, he's been unbelievable. I mean, nobody, I don't know what his numbers are. About it. Yeah. I don't know what his numbers are, but if I had to guess, 27, 8, and 5. Yeah. 26, 9, and 5. I mean, he's been unbelievable the last seven or eight games. And he's also trying to dunk on people again. Mm-hmm. I feel like his swagger is back. His, his basketball swagger yeah. is back a little bit. And it was gone from the hand injury last year. And even when he, you know, last year just crossed off. But this year, I didn't feel like he was totally Blake. And now I feel like, oh man, this guy's starting to look like the guy from 2015. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's he's why. Back, but it, a lot of it, I, th- I think you're right. A lot of it is injuries, and I think t- part of it too was when he came back from the hand injury. First of all, he wasn't he wasn't right. His his quad yeah. tendon wasn't right. But there was um, there was that, there was that hand. That, what happened with the with the hand injury and what happened in Toronto? I think that 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 kind of hung over him a little bit. Yeah, and it affected his. Not as necessarily psyche, but maybe his demeanor. Where he, well, he took he, a, he took a ton I, of shit for it. He couldn't be himself, you yeah. know. And um, and I, I just feel like he's he's gotten over that, and he's he's back to being who he is. Yeah. Did we ever figure out why the other teams don't like him? <laughs> what is it? What's your take on that? It's there's there's a couple guys every year that the other teams are just like they just seem like they try to fuck with them, and it's been that way with Blake for five years. I feel like there's a few guys on our team that are like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you had that going back to college, right? Yeah. Guys trying to chip you and cheap shot you and yeah. LB you coming off picks, trying to get you yeah. off your game. I feel like I brought that on myself. So a little bit of that is just like guys bring that on themselves. Like, right. like I'll, I mean, I've said this before and like, I love them to death, uh, but you know, like, 
Chris Paul does not shut up. Like right. he's just talking all the time. And so, you know, I think if you're playing against him, you're like, oh my God, like what? The, what you just what want to swat him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it, it can rub you the wrong way. I think that is the biggest flaw of the Clippers. If you get everybody back and you're healthy, on paper, this is the best Clippers team. Mm-hmm. Just because you, oh, yeah. you have a better bench. Yeah. The the bitching to the refs, you don't do it as much. But it starts with I Doc. Think I, I don't think I have a technical this year. That's fantastic. Yeah. But meanwhile, Boogie has like 18. <laughs> yeah. but I've made it. Well, knock on wood. It's If if I'm a referee and I have the, I'm like, oh, I got the Clippers Wednesday night. It's going to suck. And Doc's going to be yelling at me from the first minute. Chris is going to be yelling at me all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to officiate Blake. Blake's like the hardest guy in the league to figure out whether it was a flagrant or just a conventional foul. And I'm just, this is going to suck. Right. That would be my, that would be my attitude as the ref. I have to be very careful when discussing anything regarding the referees, but I would just say they're, they're human beings. Yes. They're human beings with, with feelings. They're sensitive just like any other human being. And, uh, and they take stuff I think personally. you want to be I think you want to be treated with respect and it goes both ways it really does it goes both ways and uh, well Doc Doc did this in Boston too and I always felt yeah. like it became a disadvantage to the Celtics he just takes bad calls really personally yeah he gets very upset and I don't know it's almost like you guys should make a pact like hey we've tried I think Doc <laughs> you've tried did, no we've tried almost every year Doc made an announcement to the media like uh, maybe like six weeks ago so he got thrown out of two games yeah. in, in like a two week period one and of them he got super mad yeah yeah and then so he he, you know what I think he got kicked out of a third game in November it was yeah. in Brooklyn then he got kicked out against the Wizards oh yeah you got, guys lost that Brooklyn game I was mad because we get, had the Celtics have their pick I was like really <laughs> yeah. did Doc get thrown That's out of this Brooklyn game to sabotage playing really well. pick? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. now they're 9-47 and <laughs> yeah. I think you're alright yeah I'm okay <laughs> <laughs> but he made this announcement like uh he just said like i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna cut back on the referees and and uh if i do get a technical i'm i'm gonna give the money to charity uh you know in addition to what already goes to charity our technicals yeah. out of our double contracts it. yeah so he's gonna double up um i think he's been better i'm not really sure i don't really i don't keep track of doc's technicals necessarily um he's not better but uh he's not better just, at all. you know it's I don't necessarily think it's the the worst flaw of our team, but it's it's a flaw of our team. It's you know, it's be, it's team. become a bigger flaw because all of the fans at the home games have now taken on the same <laughs> kind of mental energy, and it's like it's honestly no different than going to some of my daughter's soccer games and the parents on the our sidelines good. Some of the parents on the other sidelines that are just they think everything's a foul, and it's just this constant yeah. hysteria. And I've noticed it at the Clipper games, like the fans, yeah. it's like, Hey, the Clippers aren't going to get every call. It's, it's going to go back and forth. I think it's just part of the culture though, of sports in general is, is just like people losing their minds. Wanting to play, yeah. <laughs> wanting to place blame on something. Yes. Like it'd be, oh, the refs were terrible. Like people will say that to me after games and I'll be like, were they? You're right. Uh, the, you were, were they terrible? I don't. I. I don't know. I just feel like they made some calls. Like some were good, some were bad. Like well, that, how is that different from any other game? You know, the, the three point revolution is this the greatest thing that ever? Ha- like you might play till you're 48. <laughs> how long? Because at some point, when you when you're going to be too old to just be running around screens all day, yeah. you could still just sit in the corner and just shoot threes, right? That's yeah. another five years of your career. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that I want to continue down that that Dude, road. Go but, to forty eight. I think Ray Allen no, could be playing right now. I. I. So first of all, I. I. I never really imagined that I'd be doing this at thirty two. Right. Uh, I'm. I'm in year eleven. I'd love. I'd love to get to fifteen. I'd love to get to well, fifteen. You, t- you stay in good shape. Yeah. That's going to happen. Yeah. Um. I'm a little too vain to ever get out of shape. So like I. I stay in shape. <laughs> I'm admitting that, uh, but no, it's so I'd like to get to 15 and then we'll see what happens from there. Um, but I, I, I feel like I have four more good years in me and then we'll see how my body feels. Has your game changed at all with the way the actual sport has changed? Are you doing the same things you were doing seven years ago? What, is there any one thing that's changed about how you think about when you're on the court spots you go to or the flow of it or anything? Um, well, when I played for Stan, you know, it was very pick and roll heavy. Yeah. And so it was, I was either doing one of two things. I was either spotting up in one of the corners or, uh, I was, I was involved in the pick and roll. 
And, you know, I didn't get to run as much as like Turk or Jameer, but I did get to run pick and rolls. And then, and now with Doc, it's more catch and shoot for me. But the one, the one thing I, I stole this from Brad, Bradley Beal and, uh, and now guys are stealing it from me, but the, I, I call it the throw and go. Yeah. And so basically, you know, you have the ball on the wing or up top and you throw it to the big. And most of the time you throw it to the big and you, you know, most guys stand or they go away, they go cut away and go screen for somebody. Um, but you know, I, I throw it to the big and then I run right and get it. And so it's almost like a pick and roll. It's the same action, yeah. except I have a, I have a head start on my defender because he's not expecting it. Um, the throw and go. Throw and go. It's Bradley just, Beal. He, I stole it from Bradley Beal. Yeah, Bradley Beal is yeah. becoming a force. Yeah. And there's not, it's funny, there's not a lot of guys. Like you could almost become the guru for these guys to teach them how to run around and do these little tricks because the Warriors are obviously Kevin great Garnett had this whole conversation with me in the weight room like two weeks ago about how I should charge younger players in the offseason money so I can teach them my tricks i have somebody for you that it was you, a valid i it was actually i was like i mean i'd probably do that for free but no 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 he was like you twenty five thousand dollars for a week <laughs> after one summer you have an extra 300 grand i'm like ah <laughs> you know what i feel like that's kind of cheating but okay i mean I, i'll consider it i have the guy for you who is that malik monk on kentucky oh god if you if you made a deal with him where you get two percent of all his future <laughs> income because right now tate and i tate's host our college basketball yeah. podcast Malik Monk, who I think has a chance to be really, really special, potentially. Yeah. But on Kentucky, just stands there. They, they don't run him around on picks. Yeah. Their point guard has the ball all the time. And sometimes he just disappears from the offense and he just stands there. And, I'm, and the key for him at the next level, because he's like a 6'3 shooting guard, yeah. basically. But magical footwork and 25-foot range. If he learns how to do the circle, run around picks, the throw and goes, all that stuff, yeah. the guy's going to be unstoppable. Yeah. But if he doesn't learn that stuff, I think he's, there's a lot of guys like him, you know? You have to figure out when you're a great shooter, you have to figure out ways to get your shot off uh, in, in tight spaces. Yeah. And ways to sort of create that separation. And it's different for everybody. Um, you know, certain guys like Clay. Is great in the catch and shoot, but what makes Clay so good is he's big. Yeah, he's six six. He he doesn't jump particularly high on his shot. He just he's big, and so he he's able to shoot over guys. Devin Booker's a little bit the same way. Uh, you know, he's got some really good one on one moves, but he's a he's a bigger guy. You know, so he shoots over, you know, six three guards. Um, you know, Beal is like Beal's like the total package. Yeah, he's a total yeah. package. He can play and pick and roll. Uh, he you know he does the throw and go. Him and Wall have this great combination uh, in in transition where, like, literally Wall's throwing, like, three-quarter court cross-court passes. Right. And he's hitting Bradley Beal in stride for transition threes. Like, so, you know, he's he's a guy that kind of does it all. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to be, a, be able to shoot and make shots, but you got to figure out how to do that in an NBA game with, with scouting and with guys in your shit. The Wizards are on my radar because – the Celtics match up terribly with them. They also have one trade to make, but the the Beal Wall thing, they get Beal. What's, what's this? What's the uh, the seeds right now? Celts are Celts are close to Cleveland. I mean, they're like yeah, two so and it's a half. Two, back. and then Wizards are Wizards. Three. If you go like the last two months, the records, yeah. the Wizards, yeah, yeah, yeah. Celtics are like they're two of the top three. But so the, that could be a potential second round matchup. Yeah, and it's a bad one for the Celtics because yeah. they have nowhere to hide Isaiah against the Wizards. You know, you. You can't put Isaiah on Wall. You can't put him on Beal. So you got to put him on Otto Porter or Obre, whoever's out there, which is a problem if those guys can just shoot over him. And then they try to get him in pick and rolls to try to put him on Beal over and over again. And it's an issue. I mean, you got... You, do the Wizards wear black to every game? No, that, that was series? just that one. <laughs> do, they, do they wear black to every game that series? Well, the though? Celtics have assumed the Blake Griffin identity of they have all these feuds with all these teams now. It's like... No matter who they play, there's bad blood with something that happens somewhere, and they love it too. So every time they play against somebody, it's like a playoff game now in the in the Eastern Conference. Anyway. I love it though, man. It's you good. Got, you got to have well, you got to figure out a way to have your edge. Like if that's yeah. what it is, if you have to create these controversies and these disputes to get your edge, then do it, man. Well, you got to get that edge back against the Warriors. Yeah, the Clips. It needs to just be a very physical. You know, we're not rolling over. It's weird. This we, next it's time. weird. And I, maybe this this it was like this in the NBA when when um, 
when Jordan was playing. But I just feel like the last like two years, it's it's it all comes down. Can they? Can you beat the Warriors? Can yeah. you beat the Warriors? Whereas like five years ago, you know, you had you always are going to have a handful of teams, five or six teams that have a legit chance. But it wasn't that one team where you're like, you know, everything Cleveland is doing is can we beat the Warriors? Right. You know, the whole conversation about us, no matter what we do in the regular season, no matter if we get to the conference finals or not, it's can we beat the Warriors? Well, you came on my HBO show and you were saying like, I don't care that they got to it. I'm, I'm still... I still feel like our team is whatever. Do you, have you changed your tune on that one? No, I, I I haven't changed my tune. I mean, I obviously respect their team, like in yeah. terms of a talent level, their ability. They're obviously they're great. They're a great team. Um, but this notion that NBA players are like scared of other teams or scared right. of what other guys, care? like we wouldn't be NBA players if we were scared of other guys. I'm right. not, we're not intimidated. I'm not intimidated by anyone. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. That's a, you, I wouldn't be in where college. I am. Were you, in college, were you ever intimidated? No, I was always just the shit talking, cocky little white kid. I mean, yeah. that's who I that's was. That's why Tate didn't you like know? it. <laughs> Um, Tate almost didn't come to work today. It's like we got JJ Redick. It was for Justin Gray. Not yeah. Justin Gray. He is time. Gray. Yeah, I love Justin Gray. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, dude, going back to high school, I played AAU um, for Boo Williams for three summers on the 17 and under team. I started playing with them when I was 14. And so I was playing against stronger, better players. And it just, that, you know, I had to have... Which one was Boo Williams? Where did he go? He went to one of those... Boo? No, Boo was like, Boo played at St. Joe's in Philly. And yeah, I was going to say, yeah. didn't he have a March Madness cup of coffee where everybody got excited about him for two days? No, I don't remember. I vaguely remember. I've watched so many March Madnesses. They're all starting to blend into each other. No. But, Do you know uh, that Tate honestly believes that when Coach K doesn't like his team, he comes up with a fake ailment to leave the team for like two to four weeks? <laughs> I've heard this. UNC fans believe this I, I've stuff. I've heard this from a lot of UNC fans. There's nothing like UNC versus Duke, right? There's, well, there's, there really isn't. The I thing mean, there's like Yankees, fans, Red Sox used to be that way, yeah. but not anymore because we won. The thing with UNC fans that always strikes me as weird is they have this, they have this great program. They, yeah. They've got a storied tradition. They've won multiple national championships. They've had you know, national players a year. Jordan went there. You know, Jordan played there. And that was the big one for them. Yeah. yeah. And, and yet, somehow, after all that time, they still have this inferior, inferiority complex. With, oh, Tate. With Duke oh, people. Oh, my God. I, just, uh, Tate's, I cannot figure Tate's it out. Tate's changing your audio now. You know, there's, it's like, okay, like for Duke fans, it's like if UNC does well, like it, there's like a, it bothers us a little this is, bit. I love how you're playing this. But this is <laughs> so great. But it, it was like, Duke's success drives UNC so crazy it's, that they're oh, yeah. willing to like create these conspiracy theories about Coach K. Joe, stay stay <laughs> stay between Tate and JJ. This is great. I mean, and, you know, UNC's had to they've had to to cheat a couple times to try oh, to compete. No, I'm sorry, Tate. There's been academic scandals. <laughs> Now we're just messing did that, with Tate. Did, did, did that ever get resolved? I, I, uh, you know, you gotta, gotta look the other way a little bit on that stuff. Reggie Bullock was my teammate for a couple of years. He said he never went to class. He said he just oh never oh went my to God, class. this is great. And he, play, he played there oh, three Kerry years, Tate so I'm not sure how that worked. I'm not sure how that worked. <laughs> do you fi still follow the UNC Duke stuff? Like, Do you do you watch the Duke games like a proud alumni or you don't care anymore? Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a proud alumni, but I... I don't get to watch as much college basketball as I used to. Yeah. Uh, I, I watch Duke games, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I got to go back to the Duke UNC game uh, a few weeks ago. It was my yeah. first Duke UNC game since I graduated. My, I've only been in Cameron three times since 2006. So it was my third game in Cameron. Uh, Duke won. It was great. It was a great day. Uh, you know, went in the locker room afterwards and. And I uh, gave Coach K a hug and and got to see him, you know. Oh, the Coach K, K JJ hug. Speech. Yeah, it was, he, he seemed strong. <laughs> he seemed really strong. You know, it's well, the, of course, you, you know this, but yeah. the the Duke Hospital, the Duke Medical Staff is the it's best great, in the man. world. Yeah. So. Duke's good. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, what's the most under misunderstood thing about Coach K by the general public, in your opinion? Uh, misunderstood. Um, well, like, give me, give me a like a like a, a an idea people, about Coach K that that maybe I think that he's an opportunist. Really, that he's tries to pretend that Duke is this bastion of academic whatever, but really they've been doing a lot of the one and done stuff that Cal Perry has done. I think that's a fair criticism. That he uses the Olympic team and his association with him as a major recruiting advantage, which it is because if he's 
out with the recruit. Explicitly or implicitly? I think under the radar. Yeah. Okay. If he's with the recruit and the and the recruit's like Kevin Durant's my hero. My the only yeah, reason I'm I, doing this because yeah, yeah. and Coach K could be like, I have him on yeah. my cell phone. Let's call him. See, the pro- That's an advantage. See, the problem with that is is that uh, UNC had a recruit a few years ago that uh, wasn't as bright, I guess, and he uh, he publicly said in like an interview, he's like, yeah, Sean May called me the other day, and he was with so you Coach think Williams, does this? and UNC got in trouble for it. They did. So that's you a recruiting that, evaluation. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't remember you. who the guy was. Yeah, maybe Coach K tells all the recruits, "Hey, don't, don't like, don't so, tell the media that I've got LeBron on the phone with you right now." So it would be illegal if he did that. I mean, they probably yeah. Has he ever called you with a recruit? No, no. Or you never, never. Did it. No, I you know. said you said called. We're talking about text. text? Oh yeah, texting. What are the texting rules? I've never texted a recruit. <laughs> never texted. Never called a recruit. How much longer do you think Coach K has? Oh, I mean, he's, I think he's over seventy now. Yeah, 70 or 71. Um, but he's one of those guys, he always looks the same. He does. He's looked the same for like 40. He's like David Robinson. When I saw him a few weeks ago, I was shocked. I yeah. was expecting like he's coming off back surgery. He's going to be. No, he looked good. He looked good. Assuming he, he had the back surgery, right? Tate, Tate's not convinced there was a back surgery. He thinks he just went to Cabo for a couple weeks. Uh, that's that's crazy. Dude, you what know what? You... I, going back to one of your points, though, like the one and done thing. So yeah. my... My senior year, the year I was drafted, 06, was the first uh, year that, that uh, they, you know, they outlawed or you know, said high school kids can't come out. There was like a four or five year period there where Coach was not recruiting the one and done guys. Yep. And you know, they won in 010. It was with a, a really veteran team. They got kind of lucky because uh, yes. Kentucky didn't make the Final Four that year. They got knocked off in a previous round. I think that Kentucky team probably would have beat them. But uh, but he had to adjust. And so at some point he said, okay, I'm going to start recruiting these guys. And, you know, he got Austin Rivers. He got Jabari Parker. And, of course, the 2015 with Tyus Jones and, and Okafor and, and Justice Winslow. So he's adjusted. And that's kind of what college basketball is now. And I think he takes as much pride in, in having those guys for a year as he does for having guys like me or Leitner for four years. Have you talked to Austin? What was Austin Rivers' experience like? Because it didn't seem like that went as great as some other team, Duke one. Yeah. They had like six or seven NBA or guys that ended up playing in, in the NBA. And uh, they weren't very good. And they lost the first round. Not good. Yeah, collectively yeah. not good. Um, that was it. That was an interesting group. I so I've been a Duke fan since '92. Um, right. When when Leitner hit the shot to beat Kentucky, um, and I I kind of judge every Duke team, uh, and I'm, I'm like a I'm like a fan. I I, I you know I, I see how they interact with each other. Um, I I'm always texting Coach K, kind of getting updates on the psyche of the team or whatever, and. And uh, that was just, it wasn't a good group. Just the dynamic of the group wasn't great. I knew 2015, I knew they had something. Like, I was texting coach all season. Hey, this, you guys have a shot. You guys have a shot. I know you're young. You, I know you have a shot. And uh, I was well, the right. The problem with college basketball is because you're throwing these guys together. A lot of times they're just passing through for a year. How do you know that the chemistry is going to be out to you know? a relationship yeah. in AAU tournaments or right. at Nike camp or something. Yeah. Where do you stand on this whole Grayson Allen thing? Because once upon a time, you took a lot of shit. Yeah. I never, I never tripped anyone. Well, I mean, that's what I was saying. <laughs> I People... did throw up the shocker twice, once at Maryland and once at UNC <laughs> after big threes. But Grayson <laughs> Allen's like, he's, he's more villainous. Like he does stuff. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you know him at all? Have you talked I, 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 I know Grayson. Um, I got to spend a little bit of time with him uh, two falls, two Septembers ago. I was at Duke for about 10 days and got to know him a little bit. And then I talked to him last spring um, before he was kind of deciding whether or not to go to the NBA or not. Um, but like he, I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking. Like I really don't. Like the, the trips. I don't know. The, don't three, know. the three times that he, he, you know, legitimately tripped someone. I have no idea what he was thinking. I mean, it was, it was stupid. Since then, you know, he the, the, anything he does now is like, you know, ESPN Twitter account will will send out a video, a six second video of, of him like trying to walk through someone else's huddle. Like I, I haven't seen him do anything. So I think he's he's got sort of a, a target on his back now, but he's he's smart enough that he's not going to do anything else. That kind of scrutiny, if you can survive it. I would assume would be really good as a professional athlete. I'm sure it helped you. Oh, like all the shit me. you went through in Look, 05 there's and There's nothing 06. you can do like when you're 18 or 19 years old to prepare you 
for playing at Duke and going on the road and hearing 20,000 people literally at the same time chant, fuck you, JJ. Like that's, yeah. that's a weird feeling to have as a 19 year old. Did it mess you up? Well, my first two years at Duke, yeah, it did. It did mess me up. I created a persona on the court and off the court. I went into like this deep, dark shell because I, I didn't know who I was. And you're still trying to find your identity just like any other college kid. Like, right. Who's not trying to figure out who they are at 19? Um, and and so, yeah, it took it took a little bit of time. But I, I would say like now as an adult, like I, I don't the, the shit that some NBA players worry about, what someone says on Twitter or what a media member writes about them. Like that's not even on my radar. I've, yeah. I'm worried. About, I'm worried about so much other shit besides that. So I, I think it helped me develop thick skin. Um, actually, you know what? I, there's a chance that maybe that was already like a trait in me yeah. that kind of got brought out because of the Duke experience. If that makes sense. Well, I think it would have been a even a I don't know a more intense experience in the social media era. Oh God! Because I'm sure for Grace and Allen, I don't know if yeah. he's on Twitter and all that stuff. But I, I don't the, think I would have clips and stuff yeah, like that. I wouldn't have made it past my sophomore year at Duke if if you would have left, media. or you would have. I would have been kicked off the team if I had done what I did. Oh, you would have. You would think you would have gone after people on Twitter and stuff. No, no. I, I just I would have gotten in trouble. Like I, you know, slow mo shots of him. <laughs> yeah, it would have been yeah. Insane. No, I yeah, mean just yeah. like off the court. Like I, my first two years at Duke, I I I, I was probably more committed to being. Um, in a fraternity or acting like a frat kid than I yeah. was, you know, being a Duke basketball player. I made so many mistakes in college and bad personal choices. Yeah. I can't even imagine what it would be like to <laughs> also have that play out on ESPN yeah. and CBS right. and all right. these different places. I was worried about like what would, you know, somebody would post on like a, a UNC fan message board on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning. <laughs> And uh, and now kids, man, you you do anything, and it's it's on Twitter within five minutes, and it's on ESPN within thirty minutes. Quick break to talk about Squarespace. If you have resolved to take on a new challenge, like starting a business, changing careers, or launching a creative project in 2017, be sure to lock down your next move with Squarespace. It's used by a wide range of people and businesses, including musicians, designers, artists, restaurants. It allows you to create everything from a professional blog to a portfolio to which to showcase your work. Or an online store where you can officially open for business. You even get a unique domain to set you apart in your field. And with Squarespace's award-winning templates, creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. Nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support can help you with any problem, no matter how technical or trivial seeming it is. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code BS to get 10% off your first purchase plus a free domain that is bs is the is the code squarespace.com 10 percent off your first purchase squarespace makes make your next move and make your next website and once again seat geek since we're here don't forget download the seat geek app today or go right to seatgeek.com especially for opera tickets if you're somebody like my mom all right back to jj reddick uh, quickly, we as we were taping this uh, podcast, which had been a Tuesday morning West Coast time, uh, it just came out that the Lakers cleaned house and promoted Magic Johnson to head of basketball operations, got rid of Mitch Kupchak, and uh, Jimmy Buss is going to step down. They got rid of some people internally, including John Black, who was like the gatekeeper there forever. Pretty surprising. Magic now is going to be running his own business. He is part owner of the Dodgers, and now he's also going to run the Lakers. Did you ever think that Clippers and Lakers would flip spots from a dysfunction standpoint? Because <laughs> it, it's happened over the last five years. Dating back to the Chris Paul trade and Kobe hurting his Achilles, it's been a flip. But yet, I don't feel like it's been represented in... The Lakers have way more fans in LA. I'm sure you feel that. Oh, they have way more fans. But it's almost like the Clippers... Won. They've also won. Like, that's, that's yeah, the won. biggest difference. So, yeah. like, if they go through a, a five-year stretch like this, I mean... It's, yeah, Lakers it's due. Fan, yeah. No, Even no, 30 no Lakers team fans league, it's are, like, happen. worried. They're always, uh, we'll be the Lakers at some point again. Maybe, like, was it mid-90s? Like, the ma between Magic retiring yes. and them getting Shaq? Like, there was, Got like, a, a three- or four-year stretch where they weren't very good. True. It's weird to me that the Clippers... So, like there's times where they'll show a clip or a Dodger stadium and the fans will boo. Cause it's very like, if you're a Dodger fan, you're yeah. a Laker fan and they they have no, I got, no I, got wind of, I got wind of that. 
uh, Chris took his son, and he they got put they put him up on the uh, scoreboard of the jumbotron or whatever it's called at a baseball stadium. But they put him up there, and he got booed. My wife and I, she was like seven months pregnant at the time. This summer, we we went and uh, we were sitting, you know, behind the dugout, and they're you know in in stadium entertainment. People came over and they're like, "Hey, we're gonna we'll put you on camera and we'll put you up there." And I was like, "No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not." <laughs> I just want, I don't want anybody to know I'm here. Right. I don't want to be booed. I'm just trying to enjoy the game with my wife and my future son. So yeah, no, you're not doing that. Or the other move you could do is you put, you put a picture on your cell phone and when they show you, you just show the Quipper <laughs> logo. You just kind of own it. Oh, yeah. You get the, get the crowd own it a little up. bit. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that someday. If we ever win a championship, I'll, I'll do that. Let's talk big picture NBA. Boogie right. Cousins trade. Mm-hmm. Boogie Cousins and Anthony Davis together. I, I'm sure you have a game against them at some point this season. Wait, just as somebody who plays basketball in the same league as this team, Boogie and Davis together, what was your reaction? Uh, skill-wise, I think it works. Um, you know, from a from a fit standpoint, um, I think they they do complement each other. Yeah. Because um, both of them space the floor. I mean, and and, and I, I don't think it's interesting. I don't think that. Uh, either one has the ball in their hands for an extended period of time. In other words, they're not guys that are just going to hold the ball for 15 seconds or, you know, when people talk about like those Carmella. type of guys, like, like a ball-dominant player, I don't think either one of those guys is that. They make quick decisions, they both shoot quick, or they move it. It's one or the other. So I think I think they fit well. Um, you know, I don't, who, who's, who's their two right now? I mean, do they have any shooting... They have Drew Holiday and then a bunch of hodgepodge Drew. guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's going to be a process to I think build be, around that. I don't know that it's like they're the playoff. They're, I don't know they're getting the eight seed this year. I don't. I don't. I don't know that. I don't. I don't know. Um, I have a Boogie Cousins story, by the way. I was going to ask you if you had any Boogie Cousins material. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, uh, so my first son Knox, yeah, um, was was a direct result of Boogie, Boogie Cousins. Okay, um, my my first year in L.A. Um, it was like the 15th game of the season thereabouts and, and we're playing in Sacramento and I went up for an offensive rebound and, and Boogie had already said something to me a couple times that game and he, he gave me a little shove and, uh, it kind of upended me. Yeah. So I fell and broke my wrist and, uh, I was out like six weeks and the next day the team left for like an extended, like two week East coast trip. And I was, my wife and I were really bored and, uh, we just all of a sudden, you like, have a kid. You're so, do you want to try to have a kid? <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, yeah, let's try. And we tried for those two weeks, and and then uh, ten months later, we had Boogie my son Reddick Knox. was born. Yeah, we we did we debated about the middle name being like Marcus or Demarcus or something, you know. But we ultimately did, went with a family name. But uh, I told Bo- I told Boogie this story. I ran into him in Cabo two summers ago. Uh, yeah, at Las Ventanas, we were on vacation celebrating our anniversary. He was there with his family, and uh, and I told him the story, and he he actually he actually appreciated it. He did. Really? Yeah, <laughs> he appreciated it. He thought it was a good story. So, but yeah, my first son is is because uh, because he gave me a cheap shot. He's the best center in the league statistically. Um, when you played Sacramento, yeah. How how frightened were you of Boogie? Did you feel like you could get in his head? Like, what were some of the tactics? I mean, he's just so all over the place that it's yeah. like, it's not like he's going to figure out a way to be demonstrative. Like, it's not yeah. like you're going to get in his head. Like, True. It's, it's just that the world that is Boogie's world on the court is different from off the court, if that yeah. makes sense. Like, he, it's it, everything and everyone is against him on the court. He did. And he had never got along with Chris Paul. That was always no, like a little no. secret yeah. feud. Yeah, that's. That's that's been established, yeah. Who is the best non Warriors team you guys have played this year? Best non Warriors team we played this year. Um, it's funny we <laughs> we've beaten San Antonio twice. Yeah, um, that was weird. We played. We I play- think because you guys are so guard heavy, and yeah. that's actually like that's a, a method yeah. to potentially beating them. Houston, we played without Chris and Blake. We've only played them once, so that's kind of tough. Um, in the East, we 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 suck against Toronto. I think we have like we're like one in seven in my four years here against Toronto. Like they yeah. just always beat us. Um, I, you know the team I really like is Utah. 
Uh, and that's potentially a first that's, round. Yeah, I was going to say that's a three six um, or a four five maybe. And we we played them really well because we've defended them well in both games we played them. But um, their team that I look at and I'm like they they have the depth and the pieces. They can play a couple different ways. Right. Where they could potentially make a playoff run. Hopefully, you know, it's not against us. But I like that team. I really and I like Quinn. I mean, it, you know, Duke guy, of course. But uh, <laughs> I think he's one of the better coaches in the NBA. There's a flexibility with them that I like that yeah. they can go big or small. That that's probably the biggest is- issue with the Celtics right now is as the trade deadline comes. Like they have certain lineups that work, yeah. but then you know if they have to get a little bigger, they don't have the right guys yet. And that, that's something that I think is a big advantage for you guys because you can go small with multiple guards. You can go a little bigger with Blake and DeAndre. Like you can kind of fit to whatever the opponent is which i think is valuable and, and honestly like with the warriors they i mean their their lineup is the best lineup but they don't have the same flexibility they had last year with bogut they don't have that one lineup where it's like we're yeah. bringing in our big dude and oh they're doing this they're slowing it down they're gonna be super physical all right we're gonna bring bogut but in. you've been pretty high on javel mcgee lately offensively like, i think defensively yeah. he's you know not even remotely close to Bogut in yeah. any way no, shape Bogut or Bogut was a, was great defensively for them. I think going Jer- back to Boston, we played you know what when we played them recently on like a it was Super Bowl Sunday we played them in Boston. Yeah. Um they didn't have Bradley and uh and we didn't have Chris but uh they were as good as anybody we played this year outside of the Warriors oh, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, they were. Um it was interesting because I I felt like the entire game unless it was Isaiah dribbling into the paint like they just had you so spread out. Yeah, I think they shot like forty something threes that game. Um, we shot like twelve. I mean, yeah. it was just they just killed us because they just shot so many threes. Um, and and the way Isaiah is playing, it's they're tough, man. They're tough. They've spent the last two years mastering that spread, just spreading out. Yeah. And how can Isaiah get in the paint? And he's gotten better and better at it. Their shooting's a little better than it yeah. was last year. Well, I think with Horford, you have to respect. Like, he spaces yes. the floor. He doesn't necessarily have to shoot 42% from three. Right. But be, because of the threat of his shot, he spaces the floor. When when they played Utah a couple weeks ago, they just destroyed Utah. And they took Gobert. And I think Gobert is really good. And it was one of the few times I've seen he was kind of lost. Like, he's... They, yeah. they were just pulling him out, trying to get him away from the rim. And it's you don't want Gobert 20 feet from the basket if you're Utah. And it was the first time I was like, oh. And that's when I was thinking with you guys. Like, oh, you know, this is if the Clippers meet them in the playoffs, this is something they could potentially do against mm-hmm. Gobert that I think would be dangerous because you have multiple shooters. Yeah. You could put out four dudes. Um, Austin Rivers. Yeah. So much maligned when he came to the Clippers. <laughs> yeah. Doc traded for his son. What's he doing? I got to admit, I wasn't a huge fan of his game for a couple of years. I think he's turned into a pretty valuable guard coming off the bench. Like I, I've been impressed. I think he's better defensively than people realize. Yeah. He's definitely an irrational confidence guy, which is good coming off the bench. But did you did you see this coming with him? He's played uh, the last probably six weeks as better than I could have imagined at this point. Yeah. Um, I think at some point I could, could have seen him getting to this level. Um, he, and, and this is what makes him a good player. He believes he can be even better. Like he right. believes he can be an all-star. Um, people tend to forget like two years ago, three years ago, whenever we, we got him, like he was like 22 years old. You know, yeah. He's 24. He might've been younger. He's yeah. 24 right now. Right. Um, so I, he does still have potential. He has more room to grow, but he's, he's been one of the main reasons we've been afloat with Chris out. I mean, he's been unbelievable. It's like, I, I, I did a pod with Durant two weeks ago. We were talking about Dean waiters and Durant was saying like, Dean waiters honestly felt like he was the best guy in every game we played. Like <laughs> yeah. he really genuinely no, believes that too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. not a bad quality for a bench guard. Cause sometimes that's the guy who ends up winning game six. Right. You know, in some random road game when everybody sucks. And then Austin Rivers like, I got this, guys. <laughs> and he actually makes some threes. That could also shoot you out of the game, too. Well, he, he's he's done it in the playoffs for us. Yeah. Game six last year in Portland, him and Jamal, uh, you know, nearly nearly pulled off the upset without Chris and Blake. Yeah. Uh, game three against Houston two years ago. I think he had 25 in game three. 
uh, and did the uh, yeah did the cooking thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Harden knockoff. What's your take on him and Doc? The father son part of it is he's even a thought with the Clippers that, the, oh, that Doc is Austin's dad. Or is it just like you're so used to him as a player? I would imagine that's weird. Of course it's weird. Yeah. Like it's, if you go back to like when we were kids and like, you know, oh, pff, Coach's son. Yeah, you know, yeah. Special uh, treatment. Coach's son coach is pitching. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Coach's son is pitching again, you know. He's one and eight on the year. I don't know why he's pitching again. Yeah. But no, it's uh, it was weird at first, for sure. It was weird at first. It was It was in the back of your head. Yeah, uh, it, it couldn't be, but uh, you know Austin has has earned his place uh, w- without a doubt. So it's not something that is even really even discussed or uh, not something I think about. So I texted you a couple of days ago. I was saying you guys were fifty to one <laughs> to win the title, and it was the same odds as the Wizards. And I was like, th- those odds are crazy to me. Fifty to one seems that that's like a throwaway. This team has no chance, and it's like. I actually think people have forgotten how much talent the Clippers have, which is a nice place to be. You're under the radar. And but when is if Chris comes back even beginning of March, all that you have enough time to get him, get everybody back, get everybody fits their spots. Am I wrong to think I mean I know you you're going to be biased on this one. Mm. This question was way too long. Am I wrong to think that the Clippers <laughs> I can't talk about Vegas odds. No, but I, I know you can't talk about Vegas yeah, odds. But, but why don't people think the Clippers are dangerous anymore? Is my long my long question that I could have asked much quicker. I think the easy and the short answer is what I talked about earlier, and that's just we've been terrible against the Warriors. So I, I don't think again it comes back to that. So it's I don't think people could envision a scenario um, where we beat the Warriors unless Durant, Thompson, Curry, and Green are all hurt. You know, it's just, right. I, I, legit, I, I mean, we don't believe that, but I think most people believe like if that was, that matchup was ever happened in the playoffs, it'd, it'd be a wrap. They, they would win. Um, you know, I, I, going back to what I was saying earlier about just like evaluating our team over the last two years with the injuries we've had, like it would be great if we could have like a good six weeks of, of good health. And we could sort of figure out our identity. Yeah. Because to win in the playoffs, you have to have an identity. And it, it could be anything. But we have to figure out kind of who we are as a team and how we're going to play as a Your team. Your identity to, to me great. is, yeah, I think it, I think Blake has to become one of the top 10 players in the league again. Yeah. Which is already a process that I can see happening. But you're going to need two guys playing at the highest possible sure. level to beat that team. Sure. And you already like have. Like Cleveland last year. I yeah. mean, Kyrie in the, in the finals was unreal. But you could slow them down the way Cleveland did. I mean, basically what Cleveland did was they just messed with the pace of the game. Everything slow, everything pick and rolls, and they kind of knocked the Warriors out of that happy, go lucky, free, awesome thing they had going. And all of a sudden these games are 91 to 87 and things like that. Yeah. I feel like you guys could do that conceivably. Conceivably, yeah. And I think Chris is the point guard that could do it because yeah. of the way that he controls the game. It, I, it's interesting that you say that because I, I, when I watch, you know, them play on League Pass, I'll, I'll watch a team and and you can like attack them, you know, where you're saying yeah. like, oh, we can score on them, and you, the, you'll get in these like high pa- high high paced like really fast games, and it'll be like fifty four to thirty eight. The team will be up in the first half. It's a home game. Crowd's yeah. going nuts. Warriors are down, and I'm thinking to myself, this is just not the right way to play them. Right. Like you're playing into their hands. The more pose- if you think about it, the more possessions there are in a game. The math helps them. Yeah. It's the yeah. same thing when when Miami those guys were together with with Bosch and, and D Wade and LeBron. That's yeah. what Spolster figured out. Like we have to play at a faster pace. We need to maximize as many possessions as possible where LeBron, D Wade and Bosch are involved. And that's the same thing with the Warriors. The Celtics had success against them last year with the three guards they just they had Bradley and Smart to throw at Curry. Mm-hmm. It really made him work. And then Isaiah is just a weird matchup for Golden State because they don't really have the shorter point guard to kind of yeah. deal with him, and yeah. they don't have the right guy. And I don't know. There's something to that too, spreading them out with multiple guards. But as you said, well, it, the more possessions you have, the math is going to work against you. <laughs> Who do you guard against the Golden State? Because it seems like a lot. Sometimes Clay. Golden State's I, yeah, I, they're I, trying I, to. I guard Clay. Yeah, yeah. And Clay, game seven, I remember, which was a great game. That was one of the better basketball games I've been to. Clay, they're posting him up against you that game, but Clay doesn't really post up that much anymore. No, that I mean that was with Mark Jackson. So they yeah. they did sort of ISO 
a little bit more. Even with Curry, they would ISO him on the on the left wing at like 18 feet. Um, yeah. They posted. <laughs> I love I love I love Iguodala, but that that series they like the first three games they posted Iguodala on me like three to five times a game. I think he was like one for ten. That's that, great for you, yeah. yeah. And so I'm thinking like you're taking possessions away from Curry and Thompson. This is great right. for us. Yeah. Um, That's why he's still on TV. Curse, Jackson. Yeah, well, Kerr's thing is like, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, Kerr, I'm kidding. My Kerr's Jackson thing is guy. like you know everything has got to kind of come out of the flow. Like he's not going to like go out of his way to like attack. They, they they really just don't attack matchups. It's like just ball movement, and then we're going to move off the ball. The yeah. thing that makes him so hard to guard is like you, you've got you've got action on one side with Curry Thompson or Durant. Yeah, and then the other side you've got two of those guys too doing weak side action so right. the defense is always occupied it's yeah. really it's really hard to guard and on top of that anytime you miss a shot in transition somebody's sneaking over here somebody's sneaking over there and they just get these 27 foot open threes that for 48 minutes you just have when, to not let happen when we played them uh like a month ago we played them twice in a week so the the, the game you referred to earlier was our home game we played them a week before that in golden state we got killed uh, but in the first half, there was like two plays where uh, Curry and Thompson were on the wing in transition, and and I was I was a guilty culprit of this too. I I ran to Thompson, yeah, and Draymond just waltzed in for a dunk, or Durant waltzed in for a dunk. You'd almost rather have that happen than the three, right? I I mean, you hope everybody's back, but sometimes you just got to make those decisions. Sometimes it's so funny how the sports change like, with that stuff. We because in the old days they're just going for a layup. We played San Antonio. I think four, three or four times last year, and Pop does this all the time. But like he, he'll just like, this is how we're going to play tonight. And yeah. It's totally different than the last time he played him. So right. like the first time we played him, um, I had I had a really good game. I had over twenty, but I had like fifteen in the first quarter, and, and a couple of it was in transition threes. And uh, so the second time we played him, he, he was like, "Don't stop the ball." So like Chris Blake. I think Jamal, like we were in transition. They, they first half, they just kept laying the ball in one on zero because it would be a two on one, and Danny Green would run out to me. It was crazy. Um, Did it work? I mean, we, no, we won that game too. Okay, <laughs> so, so Pop wrote that one up. Okay, that yeah. didn't work. But no, it's like you, 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 you got to mess with that. I mean, it, especially when it's Thompson and Curry, you got to, you got to make those decisions. And that's ultimately like when you play them. It's like a series of very difficult decisions that you have to make. It's like the the lesser of two evils on on nearly every possession. Uh, last thing, unicorns. Uh, <laughs> okay. So many unconventional young guys coming in. Who's been your favorite out of like Giannis, Jokic, Porzingis, um, Embiid? What any reactions to any of these guys? Because we're in the this is now turning into the freak generation. Yeah. Um, I love Porzingis, but he's there's something amiss in New York. I think we can all agree on yes. that. And so I think that's kind of hurt him a little You're bit. You're buying this Porzingis year. stock. But I like Porzingis. Me but, too. But of the other guys. You wouldn't use him just standing 25 feet from the no. basket hoping he would get the ball? He's so skilled. You might man. want to post him up and well, yeah, just, run the whole offense around him. You can use him, him in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. It would be nice um, if the Knicks figured that out at some point over the next five years. Yeah. <laughs> They will at some point. They will at some point. <laughs> they will at some point. Uh, Giannis, I don't watch a ton of. I mean, obviously the way he plays is crazy. I think he he is a unicorn, like just his his body type, yeah. his skill set. Um, and beat is awesome. But you know, Did if you, I had have to pick you between those Embiid? four in terms of who my favorite is, it'd be yeah. Jokic. Be Jokic. Yeah, there's a lot of Jokic momentum right now. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, there'll be backlash at some point. There always see, is. But. Did you see the clip of him or the highlights of him destroying the Warriors? Yeah. He had like 17, 12, and 18 or some yeah. crazy game. And he was like Bill Walton in the 70s, like throwing these bounce passes. And Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see the Jokic It's crazy coming. to me, as good as he was <laughs> last year, that they, they, they did what they did at the beginning of the year. They wasted like 20 to 25 games trying to play him and Nurkic together. And then they... I think they benched Jokic. Yeah, they for didn't like know what a, to for do. Like a week or two, where they, he was he was getting like five minutes a game. And he's their best player by far. The first two, first like ten days of the season, the Ringers Kevin O'Connor is one of our basketball writers. Yeah. It was really good. 
And I was like, I want you to write a Denver piece. I think they're the sleeper this year. Like, go watch their games. We'll have a piece. It'll look super smart in three weeks when they become the hot young team. <laughs> and it went the other way. We wrote the piece and they immediately shit the bed for a month. Yeah. And I was watching it going, man, I, I really like this roster, but they can't figure out who should. Be. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, you know what we should do is just play Jokic. Yeah, just run the whole team I like, through. I him. like. I'm, I'm partial because he's my friend, but I like when Jameer's on the court too. Jameer's been incredible this I year. I like when Jameer's on the court for them. They're good. Jameer. Yeah. I think he, he, is he a free agent? I'm not sure. Jameer might have one more contract. <laughs> he keeps signing these three year deals. It's unbelievable. <laughs> is it, when they signed the last time they got him, I think the Celtics had him and traded like, him like a like salary a dump yeah, yeah just to like get rid of hey denver we take jameer yeah. nelson we'll give you some money it'll help us with luxury tax he, he signed with dallas and then like two months later into the season he got traded to boston and then like a month later he got traded to denver and then he yeah he you know ended up if i ran an nba them. team unless i had like the chris paul like one of those guys i would never spend money on point guards i feel like the point guard surplus like that Yogi Ferrell. I feel like there's 90 point guards who could give you minutes. And then you look at like Jameer and all these guys, I would spend all my money on wings and shooters and bigger guys. and just feel like I could get lucky with it point could, guards. That could just be cyclical. It could just be how the game is played now. Like po point guards now are different than not, not your Isaiah's and your magics, but you know, 20 years ago, I mean, Charlie Ward was like a an above average starting point right. guard. It's totally flipped. It's not. I there's mean, reasons for this. Like yeah. this year's draft, there's another. There's like going to be five more good point guards coming yeah. in the league, like elite guys. Yeah. And it's almost like the so like even at my position when I was coming out like yeah. eleven years ago, you know, I was like an undersized two. I'm six four. Like you know, that's that position now. Most guys are six three or six four. I hate four. the size thing. I've and never so understood that. It's like that. all these really all these guys that were like tweeners the undersized guys are now just they're just ball dominant point guards i can't scorers. even believe that's a conversation anymore because of you no, and avery bradley not, and yeah. isaiah and draymond it's like why do we the care if somebody's an matter. inch too short it doesn't matter one thing i was thinking with point guards though and i, I it's just a theory I, I haven't really looked into this for 20 hours but i wonder like you have 25 years of aau right the best position if you're playing aau you want to be the point guard because you, you have the ball the all the guard, time yeah. Yeah. So the better athletes, the dads or the coaches or whatever, they're just putting him at point guard because that's the guy who controls everything. I think and now that, I wonder if there's yeah. if that we're seeing the fruits of that now. I think that's actually a really good theory. It could be. I really. Do. I don't know if it's true. I because even like, like when you when you, or at least when I was you know in high school or you know when I still paid attention to uh, to scouting reports of high school players, like when there's a there's a, a big with potential, let's say. Um, you know, they, you'll make a comment. They just don't get the ball that often. Like the right. bigs don't get the ball. It's miserable. In, in, in AAU. And, uh, and if, I also think guys that are guards and maybe are six, two and not seven feet, like you're just more coordinated at that position. Sure. So you're able to develop your skill set a little bit more. So, you know, could be just a little bit of Gladwell's, you know, 10,000 hours where those guys just have the ball in their hands more at a young age and but that's another know, five, reason 10 years later they're 22 tw you know 25 years old and they're they're great that's another reason why big guys can shoot threes now i'm convinced so they're they're why post up you're not going to get the ball but if you shoot threes you in have AAU, a chance to get the yeah, NAU so and the like big, coming up yeah. big guys like this this is better for me. i'll get more shots if i can shoot threes they just start practicing all yeah. the time but like you look at uh you're not watching a ton of college but markel faults on washington who's probably gonna be the number one pick I, yeah so in a different generation, he's Allen Houston. Yeah. You know, he's this guy. He's really good. He's a good three-point shooter, but he's really good, like 15 to 20 feet. He's got this little, yeah. gets his spot. He shoots high over his head, and it's Allen and he's Houston. Like, he's bigger, right? Yeah, he's bigger. He's got yeah. size. He can get to the rim. He's a two-guard 20 years ago, and now he's a point guard. And, you know, if you look at the team like the Celtics, like they would just play him at the two-guard, but he has that point guard resume and I, it seems like that's where all these guards are going i don't know if there's specialists like like you back in there where you're like that guy's a two guard right that guy run him out and that's why malik mock is so interesting to me that's why you need to take him under your wing just get like two percent <laughs> oh i forgot one more thing is kg really around the team 
Yeah, he's, he's around the team. Yeah, but he's doing this. He's not just doing this for us. He's yeah. around some other teams too. But you KG. I mean, there's no bigger character in the last yeah. 20 years in the league. Yeah. So he was he was with us on this last uh, road trip we did. Oh came, no, really? He came to like three of the cities. Yeah, he came to three of the cities, and um, I guess it was it was Charlotte. Yeah, I was in Charlotte after practice, and me and him just were like in the weight room together, and uh, he starts. Doing me KG all these, stuff? Yeah, just it's very KG stuff. I'm looking at our strength coach like, are you listening to this right now? Like, this is where he told me like, you need to you need to take young guys in your wing and charge them $25,000 for a week. I love that. He also told me that, um, he's like, you know, how do you think Beyonce is in such great shape? I'm like, uh, I don't know. It's like one time I saw her working out. She was doing her dances and she was singing while she was dancing. So then I'm thinking to myself, Maybe I should run and sing at the same time. So in the off seasons, I would go to Malibu. I'd go down to the beach and I'd run to the beach and I'd be like, la, 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 while I'm, while, I'm, while I'm running. So then when I get on the court, I'm getting back on defense. I'm talking on defense. I don't get tired. And I'm like, okay, there's, some, maybe, there's maybe something there. But he also, he told me some other stuff too. Like he told me like after the first game of a back-to-back, so in between games, that I should go run on a treadmill for 30 minutes and that I should, uh, I should lift weights. So, I mean, KJ, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I'm giving away your secrets, but like, I just, I don't know if that's for me. So KJ would, KJ would play a game and go lift, go lift and, and run on the, the treadmill. Day. And well, play the he next said, day. he said, he said worm. He saw worm run on the treadmill one, one time, but he's like, you know, you have, you got to play like worm where you're like running around. You're an energy, energy guy. So it might benefit you. Wow. I wanted to say I'm pretty sure Worm was on something. That's why he was able to do that. Right. <laughs> he was flying. <laughs> yeah. Do they talk about uh, the Celtics at all, KG and Paul? Any war stories? Any Rondo? Nothing? No. Get that for the next podcast. Get right. some war stories. I, yeah, those guys, I mean, they kind of go off in their little corner, and they're, they're chatting to each other. But we haven't, we haven't heard any. Uh... Paul hitting that three was amazing in it Boston. Was. It was. It was. It was like secretly a super high pressure three. The crowd's calling for him for the whole quarter. Yeah. He comes in. Hadn't played He's since the first cold. three minutes yeah. of the game. That's a hard shot. It was almost like it a is. fan getting called in to hit a half court would shot. It been, would it have been? Would been like a total dick move if I because Isaiah Thomas was like the closest defender. If to he him. just jumped at him, <laughs> if he had just like tried to strip it or jumped at him, you know who would have done that? Off the line. Marcus Smart would have done that. He Marcus doesn't give a shit. He probably would have. Yeah, he would have done anything. He JJ gave me a Redick. nice shiner, man. He, I got seven stitches from that game. Marcus elbowed Marcus. me. Marcus. Oh, yeah, that's right. Me in the eye. Yeah. I just got my stitches out a couple of days ago. You um, know, the Celtics fans, Marcus is like our dude. I know. That's our guy. I know. He's a fighter, man. I know. You, when, when you play the Celtics, you're like, oh, shit, I got Marcus Smart. I got to deal with him today. I respect guys like that. Yeah, he's good. He's he a plays fighter. hard every night. Um, well, I hope the trade deadline, I hope you get out of it intact. Thank you, man. I want to see this Clippers team stay together. I would like to as well. And then, uh, and then we can keep talking during the uh, during the season. I'm here if you need. All right, podcasts talk about shit. Good JJ deal. Reddick, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to JJ Reddick. Thanks to SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Don't forget SeatGeek. Buy and sell tickets on your phone in just two taps. Everything is fully guaranteed. It is by far the easiest way I found to shop for the best tickets. Thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Download the SeatGeek app today. Or go right to SeatGeek.com. And please check out The Ringer this week. We are in our sweet spot with the NBA. A lot of trade deadline stuff. A lot of good columns about the Boogie Cousins trade. The Ringer NBA show is going to be humming every day this week. And uh, and the trade deadline, I guess that's going to be my Friday column if something happens. I assume something is going to happen with all these chess pieces. And uh, and don't forget Clippers 50-1 to 1, in case you love Iron gambling. Nice, nice little sneaky thing. JJ has no comment. Uh, yeah, we're back. Uh, we have two more podcasts coming this week on Wednesday and Friday that are good ones. So until then. <laughs>